So you've got the coral animal. You typically will have zooxanthellae, which they will harbor. Then there's a plethora of microscopic creatures that we do not see, and sometimes we can't even grow. They can't be even be cultured. So there's bacteria, archaea, fungi. There's even species of algae that live in the coral skeleton. So endolithic algae. There's protozoans. Basically, every domain of life is、uh, takes re- up resident in the coral and plays a Central role in some way. It's it's you know all the same principles of ecology that apply to a total reef apply as like a microcosm to an individual piece of coral. What's up, reef fanatics? Welcome back to another podcast episode here on the Coral Reef Talk. And today I'm super excited about today's episode because, as I often say, it's great to be a student, always be learning, and I feel like we're gonna learn a lot today, Levi. How are you doing? Absolutely, I'm doing good. How about yourself? You know what? I'm hanging in there. I, I think my ribs are getting better from my skateboarding injury.、Um, so maybe the next episode you won't hear me talk about that. But、um, <laughs> the tanks, the tanks are doing well.、Um, the 125 is getting over a little bout of、um, cyano that popped up. Um, but I mean, other than that, it's doing well. The the ten gallon tanks are doing great. Got new fish in there.、Um, how about your tanks? Everything's doing really good.、Um, got some new stuff for like the macro tank. Elizabeth's tanks doing really well. All the other tanks are doing well. Still、uh, trying to figure out exactly what happened with the NPS tank.、Uh, Ooh, I put a、yeah. little scarab angel in there the other day, and it, it's doing fine. So maybe the water change affected. I I don't know. I'm still very confused. Still a mystery, huh? I still want to kind of wait before I add anything expensive again. Before I I need an ICP test, and I want to do an equal biomics just to like figure out exactly what happened. Yeah, it makes me nerve wracking to add more stuff. Yeah, definitely, and I I think that's a good idea. Maybe wait a little bit and try to see. What you get back from those tests, and talking about aquabiomics and taking a look at the microbiome and that world of reefing, we have a very special guest on the show today, and you may have heard of him if you check out Reef Builder articles. I'm sure you've read some of his articles, but today on the show we're going to have Salem Clemens, and he has been in the hobby over a decade. He's worked in the industry, worked at some fish stores as well. Uh, he's studied、uh, molecular biology, coral pathogens, zooxanthellae. So, I feel like we're in for a treat in today's episode because we're going to learn a lot. So, please welcome to the show, Salem. How's it going, Salem? Pretty good. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty good. I'm I'm excited to、uh, talk about coral pathogens. That's my thing. I'm excited to be on. Thanks for having me. I got a few questions for you just to kind of start things off here. Kind of just what got you into the hobby originally? I think that's a question that many people might have. Yeah. So I'd always liked fish and like the ocean and stuff. So like there was like a little tiny aquarium. I'm in Kansas City, so my mom sometimes would take me there when I was like really little, and I was always infatuated by it. And、uh, We went to vacation one year to Sanibel Island, Florida, and my parents were like looking for things to do around the islands, and they found this thing called the Sea School, and it's this program that was ran by a marine biologist, and、uh, they're like, "Do you want to do this?" I said, "Yeah." So when I was like, I think ten, I went out into like the, he took us out in the field, explained the ecology, like took us to the estuaries and like the mangrove flats and the sandbars. We went and collected data with him. He was studying like different ichnoderms at the time, so sea urchin populations, sand dollars, things like that. And then he had a bunch of like reef tanks and stuff all over this place. So I came back and was infatuated with it. I did a bunch of chores, and there was a a little freshwater tank I got. And then eventually I found this saltwater tank for sale on Craigslist for like nothing, a little ten gallon cube. And then、mm-hmm. it's been a It's been an addiction since then, so I'll start somewhere. Yeah, and that that tends to be how it starts, right? You get like a cheap tank, set it up, get your fish, some corals in it, and then it just progresses, right? You get more and more tanks. Yeah,、Too、I know for me,、tanks. I started. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, like,、uh, what aspect of the hobby, or what's your favorite thing, like that the hobby has to offer?、Hmm. So, I think the, the most practical thing the hobby offers, like you know, as as something as as an industry, is probably education about these things.、Mm-hmm. So, I mean, having people go and keep coral requires a you know sufficient amount of education about those animals. And then I think that allows people to be more in touch with the conservation side of things, of being aware that you know here's where they're from, here's how you know what how easily they can die, and 
hopefully can maybe cause some reflection on how our actions can impact the natural world. So that's the ultimate thing that I think the hobby can offer is a very easy and personal way that people can view these animals when otherwise, you know, they're probably not seeing coral or most people haven't seen coral in the wild in their entire lives. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah I think that's definitely one thing that I would agree with you on for sure. Like when I have people over, they instantly see the tanks and they just start asking questions. So I'm able to so help educate them on stuff that they have no idea, you know? So everyone kind of gets to learn and, ask questions yeah and like you mentioned like most people are not gonna go see these animals out in the wild and the closest they're gonna come to them are gonna be like a public aquarium and just being able to keep these species and these animals at home is a really cool thing but like you mentioned some of these things some of these animals are more challenging to keep than others so do you recommend for someone just getting into the hobby because they someone may see all these like incredible like acros like sps coral beautiful reef tanks and they're like i want my tank to be that but would you recommend if they're just getting their feet wet maybe start with like soft corals or something like that or just do a ton of research before they jump in i think it really depends on the person right so some people are very easily i think it's like a psychology thing or who knows, right? But some people are able to read information and then deploy that information very effectively. So there's some customers I know for a lot of the shops I've worked for or people I've sold coral to, and they just watched like every YouTube video ever, scoured reef to reef. And they're just like, all right, so I keep acros like this, right? And I'm like, yep. And then they just do well with them. But some people, you know, it's a more, they learn experientially and it takes time to to really put those things into practice. So I think that there are people that can do both. I think as a general best practice though, definitely take your time. And even if you're good at reading and uh, deploying that knowledge, getting experience is always good before you go and buy like a rainbow splice. Absolutely. So you've kind of been in this world of uh, studying Delhi or in the scientific world of like coral pathogens and stuff for a while. What does that kind of look like? So kind of started with, I was selling coral. It was when in the, the last endo band. So torches were like a thousand dollars a head. Mm. I'd gotten pretty good at growing coral. So I had invested in some really expensive torches and then brown jelly happened, lost them all, tried my best at the time to save them. There was, this was like before the KFC dip and stuff. So uh, tried mm. my hand at experimenting with antibiotics and things like that definitely came back to bite me. So I had taken microbiology recently and I, I'm a molecular biology, biotechnology major. And I realized, hmm, maybe I have some of the skills where I can actually look at this. So I go to a smaller university. Every single person in my uh, program is required to take a research credit to graduate. So you pair up with an individual professor. So, so someone that's got a doctorate in any of the biology fields and you do a research project with them. So I approached uh, one of my better, like, you know, favorite professors and I said, Hey, how about I do my own research project looking at this? Would you be willing to help me? And she was like, let's do it. And it's been two years, been looking at it. I read a lot about it. It's been, you know, a very large download of all of the literature out there. And then it's gotten into, you know, practical experiments from that. So yeah, it's really taken off. I've been working on a lot. So it started with brown jelly, but I'm also looking at coral uh, disease pathways writ large. So, you know, that's your RTN, STN jelly. Sometimes you'll get like the white jelly. And uh, I have some thoughts that all of it is kind of a similar served and universal pathway. So that's what I've been looking at. I've got a couple experiments left. Hopefully if science is on my side and there's a lot of luck involved, I will be able to talk about my results uh, once I graduate. So it'll be in May. Awesome. Very cool. And like, it's a super fascinating world, like the microbiology of everything. So let's kind of jump into uh, maybe some coral pathogens, maybe uh, talk about what makes up a coral. If, if you want to start there uh, to bring kind of the beginner average reefer kind of up to speed, like what really is a coral? What are we really keeping in our tank? And kind of break that down to what you, you've kind of been studying and looking at with that. Yeah, so the, the number one concept to understand is that of the holobiont. So, you know, we're looking at that word, holo means whole, biont refers to life. So it's the total life around a certain organism. 
So the current conceptualization of coral is not that they are just an animal that may or may not harbor zooxanthellae, depending if they're photosynthetic or not, but rather they're kind of an ecosystem in of themselves. So you've got the coral animal, you typically will have zooxanthellae, which they will harbor. Then there's a plethora of microscopic creatures that we do not see, and sometimes we can't even grow. They can't be even be cultured. So there's bacteria, archaea, fungi. There's even species of algae that live in the coral skeleton. So endolithic algae, there's protozoans. Basically, every domain of life is uh, takes re up resident in the coral and plays a central role in some way. It's, it's, you know, all the same principles of ecology that apply to a total reef apply as like a microcosm to an individual piece of coral. And each species of coral, each subspecies of coral, corals of the same subspecies in different regions, different island chains can have different microbial partners that fill those same niches. So it's the kind of this converge, you know, convergent evolution that occurs. So Think about how pollinators have independently evolved in every continent on Earth. If there's a food supply available in an environment, a species will evolve to take advantage of that. And the same thing applies with the microbiome of these different corals. So, you know, if they're producing nitrogenous waste, there could be a plethora of different microbial species that can associate with that coral and, you know, utilize that as a food source. So the, the number one thing to, to know is one, the coral is much more than the coral itself. There's a whole community there and all of them are very important. And it's a very, very hard to maintain balancing act. And two is that community can be variable. So it's not, there's not like, here are the microbes you need in your tank. They're just looking at what microbes perform, what ecological function, and are those functions in balance when it comes to looking at corals in a diseased state, which is something as humans, we typically... That's not how we think of disease. We think, mm -hmm. okay, I've got COVID. It was the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But with corals, it's a it's a lot more complicated, which I can go into if you want me to. But that's kind of the initial concept is the holobiont. Yeah, very cool. And that's a little bit different as far as what, I guess, what a lot of us have learned is that you have a coral and they have the symbiotic relationship with those in Delhi. But that's just a piece of the puzzle, correct? Exactly. And I mean, the zooxanthellae themselves have relationships with these bacteria too. It's very right. much a, an entire ecosystem where they're all interconnected and interdependent on each other. The coral is a central regulator and is kind of like, uh, I guess, the environment that these things live on, similar to how, you know, you have things that live in a rainforest. But uh, mm -hmm. it's very crucial. So Yeah, so whenever you're keeping... A reef tank then because of everything that resides in a coral you're trying to get that balance that you're talking about in the reef tank but as far as like different parameters and stuff that you're trying to keep there's a lot of variables but whenever something's going wrong and your coral is starting to have that disease state or starting to like a sp coral like uh, rtn you know what is something we need to look out for or what kind of causes that? That's kind of what I've been asking myself. So that's, yeah, <laughs> gotcha. I can answer it the best I can try. Uh, so yeah, obviously there are a lot of variables. And yeah. the thing is we get caught up with like, what's our phosphate? What's our nitrates? What's the alkalinity? Right. And in terms of the coral, they're very genetically plastic and they can adapt to just about anything. You know, there's mm -hmm. obviously exceptions to that, but for the most part, they don't care what the number is. But what they do care is that that number is consistent. So I would say chase stability rather than these individual parameters. If you get to the point to where you can, you're can, you stable and then you can tweak the parameters, that's even better, right? Because you know having a higher pH, faster calcification, things like that. So there's advantages to tweaking your numbers in different ways. But overall, it is instability that causes a shift in the microbiome to where it can trigger a more disease, like disease state, which I can go into that if you want me to. It'll be a rant, but I can definitely explain how that happens. But uh, yeah, the biggest thing is remaining stable. Now, typically if people have issues, I typically ask alkalinity, phosphates, pH, because those are the three things that typically people will struggle with maintaining in a stable fashion. Those are the things that swing the most with how uh, technology, you know, equipment and time has affected the hobby as of now. So yeah. Now, in one of your articles, you talked about, I believe it was antibiotics and stuff being overused in uh, the reef aquarium hobby and how that is definitely affecting the microbiome and how we are treating our corals in our tank. Can you speak a little bit 
about that? Yeah, so antibiotics are very powerful and selective tools that have been developed for, you know, about a century now in human medicine. And the thing is, is, you know, antibiotics are designed for a specific purpose. So, for example, you got the fluoroquinolones. That's like things like Cipro or you've got class floor class four fluoroquinolones right now that are being used to replace older versions of them because resistance has occurred and they, but they all act in basically the same way. There's many different subclasses of different antibiotics and each of them do a different job. So for instance, some might inhibit the ability for the DNA to be replicated by knocking out the DNA gyrase. Some of them are maybe only effective against gram positive bacteria, some gram negative. And it seems that the current zeitgeist in the hobby is throwing a multitude of different antibiotics at a problem. And I guess I will just ask a series of questions. And if anyone can answer them, maybe I'll look at it in a little bit better way. What pathogen are you trying to eliminate? Why are you using the antibiotic that you're using? Why are you using the dosage that you have chosen? How, why are you using the contact time that you're doing? Like These are all crucial things that doctors have to answer when it comes to prescribing them to humans, right? Like if I go and I have strep throat and they determine it's bacterial, I'll take amoxicillin for a week and I have to take the pill two times a day. That is not just because they feel like it, but the antibiotic has to be in your system at a certain saturation point for a certain amount of time to ensure that all those bacteria are completely eliminated. And the thing is, is now, you know, this better understanding of the microbiome is that, yes, there are pathogenic and bad bacteria, but also a lot of the bacteria that make coral sick are ones that are good. And then external conditions will change and they will become bad. They become opportunistic. So in a world where you're using antibiotics, you're wiping out all the good guys that are crucial to the coral's metabolic function, defense, what have you, you could be wiping out some of these frenemies, which under better conditions will switch back to being good. And you also don't know if you're even eliminating the bad ones because you don't know what you're targeting in general. So I just, an antibiotic resistance is very real. It is a very big issue in human medicine right now. For instance, like uh, the strains, like they're wiping out a ton of people in hospitals right now, and there's no way to treat them. So we just don't have the selective tools nor the knowledge. And it's not just at the hobby level, but at the precipice of academia, I mean, there are still not reliable treatments that, that have been developed uh, to address these things because it's such a complex issue. You're trying to achieve ecological management at a smaller level. And that's something mm -hmm. that's never really been done with a chemical solution. So, I mean, this is why stony coral tissue loss disease has wiped out the Caribbean. It's a microbial multifaceted infection, which just has fungal protozoan and bacterial components. And there's not an eat, there's not a silver bullet to that. And anyone trying to tell you there is, it's probably trying to make some money off of it. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, it, that's tough when, like you're saying, we don't even know really every aspect of what we're trying to combat when we're using that. But I've sent off an aquabiome test of the microbiome and I've actually have some SCTLD in the tank. And so it's a very, very small amount. Let me see. I had my report up earlier. It's like 0. 0.0003 or something. But I mean, it's still in there. And I don't know if that is the reason why I can hardly have any LPS corals in the tank. Like there's some LPS corals that do well. And then there's some that I'll put them in there and a the month later they'll be gone. So do you see that as uh, with it being an issue in the ocean coming into the hobby? Now, we're not going to really know about this unless we send off for one of these tests. And then people just can't keep LPS corals or since corals are super adaptive, it seems like what I've heard is that LPS corals, as long as they're healthy, they can kind of combat it pretty well. Yeah. So that's the thing is you're pretty much never going to have a pathogenic event without a correspondent abiotic stress event. So you're going to have to have a swing to knock that coral off of its even footing to then have an infection take place. And there's a lot of much more complicated chemistry that goes along with that to where corals can produce, well, the zooxanthellae actually can produce certain types of uh, residual compounds that are a result of stress reduction pathways. And a lot of these pathogens have evolved to sniff out these compounds. So it's almost like vultures circling their prey. They can tell which corals are the most susceptible to infection and translocate directly to them. But if you don't have that abiotic stress event, if your tank is stable, the coral can maintain a more beneficial uh, microbial profile, which can act as a defense mechanism. And they're also not producing those info chemicals. Now, in terms of adaptation, 
corals do not have an adaptive immune response. So I've seen some people throw away the, like throw out the idea of like, uh, could corals gain immunity? Could we infect corals with brown jelly? And then they come back out on the other side and yeah, you could have stuff survive the infection, but also, you know, there's not an antibody type system. There's not any sufficient memory that's established immunologically within corals since they're such a rudimentary creature. So while they have an, an, a, you know, an innate immune system, things akin to kind of similar like to like our white blood cells that just kind of shoot first and ask questions later. And they also have the good bacteria that live in them that can eat bad guys. They don't have a way to remember those uh, types of infections. So that's, that's something I will dispel is there's probably not hope in that regard, but if you've got a coral pathogen, your best bets are to try to shift the microbiome in natural ways. And that could be adding other types of media sources. So more live sand, more live rock, different locales. Get the aquabiomic sand, which has been cleared of pathogens. That's a good option. Uh, carbon dosing can help shift things one way or the other as well, depending on your existing profile. And then I do not utilize amino acids. A lot of these coral pathogens can take up free aminos. And there's some other things I won't go into, but aminos can cause a lot of this, I think. And I do not utilize them anymore. And since stopping them, yeah. have had more success. Really? Okay. So when a coral's going downhill like that, like with brown jelly or uh, they're just not doing well, what is kind of your take on uh, like the best way to kind of help that or to treat that coral? Are we pulling the whole coral out, dipping it? Are we using like a, an iodine solution? With the coral what what do you recommend how do you look at that so you have to first evaluate kind of where the coral is at if this is like it's already half jelly like you know far. yeah yeah it's it's i mean yeah it's too far at that point pretty much i mean you can maybe try to do it but you're gonna have slim to no chances of saving that coral and even if you do it's gonna take months to years for it to fully recover and to come back and the thing is is even if you get rid of the actual active you know, recession at that point, it can still harbor a very dysbiotic microbiome, which can then kind of be a sleeper cell and you have another abiotic stress event spreads it again. So mm. at that point, in my mind, it's like, this is too much risk. You know, if you want to try to keep it alive, quarantine tank it, do not include it in your grout or display, keep it isolated. In terms of if you see things kind of have the, res like, you know, initial warning signs of like, you know, poor polyp extension, they've got excess mucus production, uh, coloration might be decreased. If it's a systemic thing at that point, you know, sometimes it's best to take a hands-off approach, address what the issue is, you know, send out your ICP. If you've got high, you know, high, like contaminants, there's things you can take there, but sometimes just letting the corals chill from that stress event. Like, let's say you had it like, you know, programming on your apex mess up and like a doser stayed on and it spiked your pH because you're dosing calc. At that point, chill, like dipping it, taking it out is going to only compound that stress. If it was a, just an initial swing from a mechanical failure, you can identify. Like say, if it's more of an unknown, if it's only one coral that's struggling, if it's the whole tank and you don't have an obvious solution, that's where diagnosis with aquabiomics and ICP is important. And that's also where you might consider things. Like I say, iodine's an okay option. Potassium chloride, I think, could be an okay option. Also, visually looking for larger eukaryotic pests, right? You could have flatworms, mm -hmm. you could have nudies, things like that that are causing stress. And it's not a, you know, a microbiome issue. And then also, uh, there's, you know, some types of heterotrophic bacteria on the market. And these are not saltwater strains, but they can certainly outcompete or ingest some of these more pathogenic strains. So an example is Dr. Tim's EcoBalance. You probably will not like me saying what's in it, so I won't, but there's been people that have sent off aquabiomics and it is not saltwater strains of bacteria, but nonetheless, uh, they can eat Vibrio. And there's been mm -hmm. some evidence that adding it to your tank can shift the microbiome away from like a Vibrio heavy, heavy system, which they are, you know, nor known coral pathogens. So, you okay. know, chemical solution potentially, but also probiotic bath, you know, adding them in with something like that and letting those other bacteria do that work. Yeah. And then similar to Hydrospace, their product is not a saltwater strain either, but adding that seems to help things as well. Yeah. ProBio is a very interesting one. I think it's pretty important for nutrition. Yeah. The, the PNS yeah. stuff, you know, like I say, it, it really encapsulates the idea that corals are bacteriovores. I mean, that's where a lot of their heterotrophic nutrition does come from. And on top of that, you know, having something like that, that eats free nitrogenous waste in the water kind of bioremediates and cleans up your tank too. So it's kind of two birds and one stone. 
But yeah, that's the thing is there's just not anyone that has got the infrastructure developed to isolate a lot of these strains, to do the vetting, to determine if they're pathogenic or not, and then to commercialize them. And that's something that, you know, it's probably going to be five or 10 years off still for anyone to do. Mm -hmm. But once there are actual coral associated probiotic strains out there, that's probably where the hobby is heading. And that'll be pretty beneficial, I think. Yeah, very cool. Well, now we're going to take a quick break here and we're going to jump into our scientific segment. Levi's got something lined up for us. What do you got, Levi? So today we have the orange tree or the orange octo gorgonian, uh, Swiftia exerta, one of my favorite gorgonians ever. Uh, you can, there's a couple different uh, variants that tend to come in. Uh, you get some with like orange with purple polyps or orange with orange polyps. They're pretty cool. They're unique and you don't see them too often in the hobby anymore. I feel like they used to be a lot more popular. Uh, and that may have just been because there wasn't many people collecting them because uh, they are deep water coral or octo coral. Usually you don't see them under 100 feet. Uh, I know a diver that collects them and he says, yeah, usually about 100 to 150, even more. So it's pretty cool. So I just got a couple more questions. What's your favorite coral? Like, do you have a favorite coral or is it too hard to choose? Man, it really depends on the day, you know. Like, I like I Ghanis like a lot. Ghanis are awesome. But, you know, getting to the, NP the NPS, like Dendro Nephthi are awesome. I really oh, like, amazing. I mean, like, there's nothing like them. Like, I really like Dendro and Scalario Nephia quite a Definitely. bit. If I could keep them, you know, better, I think that'd probably be number one for sure. There's just, mm -hmm. like, nothing color-wise like them. They're awesome. For sure. Nice. So, talking about your favorite corals and stuff, I think we're going to put you to the test here. Okay. And we're going to toss up. We've done this segment once before, but I'll be interested to see... Uh, if you can figure it out. So we are going to show you uh, some pictures that could be AI generated of some corals and like reef tanks, or they're going to be real. And you're going to have to tell us which one. Is it real or is it AI? So here we go. We'll just jump right into the first one and take a look at this. Oh, that's real. That's that one. There's some European guy that's got that. I got in a fight with him on Facebook, actually. Yeah. I know that guy. Right. He's in like, Dutch, like Holland or something, I think. See, I saw this picture. I was like... This might be an easy one, so nice. This is a lot. It's expensive, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, that looks like an expensive tank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a great super, collection. Super colorful, too. How about this one right here? The lighting is so off with it. Like, <laughs> I I, I want to say that's AI generated. It, like, looks fake. Like, the, the bottom looks legit. The coral uh -huh. look accurate. I gotta like look closer to my computer screen. Like I don't know what species these are though. I think that's an AI generated one. A hundred percent. Yep, you're two for two so far. All right, let's go to this one. That's AI generated too, but it almost looked like a Yuma at first. I was like, dude, that's like that might be a like a really weird Yuma. Nice. Yeah, I thought I was gonna get Levi with this one in the last last time we did this, but you both pass. The the lighting's a lot better on that one. That looks mm -hmm. a lot like more like a coral picture, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy Definitely. what these. AI images can do, especially this one. Oh, is that dude? That's like uh, that's Mike C soft coral tank on YouTube, I think. <laughs> I picked two common of two common knowledge photos. To <laughs> Good job, yeah, you got him four for four. That that one, the lighting's weird though. I can see that stumping someone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't want to throw too many at you. I didn't want to make it too long of a segment, but you did really good. Fast. Thanks, man. So continuing talking about the coral pathogens and the microbiome and stuff as uh, like new hobbyist, average reefer, someone they're just getting their feet wet. Maybe they uh, just started introducing corals to their tank. What's like a main takeaway from what we've talked about that they need to know? So I would say one, worry about stability more so than anything else. Even if your numbers are not perfect, don't just go like, you know, if your nitrates are like at 50 or something crazy, don't just like a 90% water change on your 10 gallon cube, you know, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> like really just take things slowly and incrementally. And you will likely have way more success doing that than chasing what like all the YouTube influencers and stuff will say, like, I got this product and it fixed my tank. Like just learn the basics, learn them really well, you know, maybe do water changes at first before you dip your toes into traces and stuff like that. And just uh, master the basics, you know, don't have to always have the nicest coral. Buy what you want. That's something that I've struggled with for a long time. As someone who's grown and sold corals, I'm always buying the new hottest thing. But until recently, I, I finally started buying corals that I actually liked. And it's a, it's a lot more fulfilling that way. Mm -hmm. Don't do it as a status symbol. Do it for you. So those are the two things I would say. 
enjoy it and take it slow and have your tank be stable. Awesome. Yeah. hundred percent agree. Too many times we fall into the comparison trap of other people's tanks and, oh, we want to have the coolest acro or that crazy named coral. And man, just getting the fundamentals down and just the basics and actually seeing your corals grow, it's huge. So when it comes to coral disease and stuff, what are some of the most common things that we're going to see in the beginning stages of our reefing journey? What are some of the more common coral diseases? Yeah. So the easiest way to talk about these is just looking at symptoms because many different things can cause the same symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, brown jelly is a big one for any LPS. You're going to see them rotting. It's going to smell terrible, like just the worst thing ever, you know, completely dark brown. Everything just goes into a poof cloud. There's kind of this like alternative white jelly, which I've not seen a lot of people talk about, but it's something I've observed quite a bit working at different shops. So same thing, but it's a bright white jelly instead of a brown jelly. Seen on elegance a lot, like kind of the elegance coral syndrome, late stage stuff that happens like Duncan's will get it quite a bit on the stem and then it'll work upward. It's kind of odd. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, if you've got any types of encrusters or crows, then you'll see RTN and STN to where you'll, you know, overnight it'll be gone. Poof. All the skin just comes off or it'll be months or even years of a slow decline. Those are kind of the, the four common ones. There's a lot of other stuff too, though. I mean, there's some very weird, uh, like brown band disease and black band disease that more so affect wild corals. But I have seen symptoms of them on some area like that I got in that I had in my quarantine tank. And you'll see from like the center out some of the polyps, there'll be like a band that just dissipates out where there's a, it's almost like STN, but it, mm -hmm. it presents differently because differently the edge of that is completely pitch black. It almost oh. looks like this layer of jelly around it. So it's almost a combination of these symptoms. But I mean, yeah, the warning signs are always going to be the coral's not extending very well. You're going to have a lot, a lot of mucus. And those are your first two things to look out for. And just naturally watching and getting used to observing your tank and internalizing, did this coral look like this? Or even taking pictures every so often is a very easy way to, to track those symptoms. Yeah, definitely a, a fan of taking pictures of your corals. I mean, not only for growth, but definitely, yeah, you can see how they're re reacting and responding to certain things. What what do you what do you got, Levi? What do I have? How many tanks do you have? Uh, seven. Oh, we're tied. I had to count, and then I've got like my pod and phyto cultures, but that's those are not really tanks. So yeah, sweet. Yeah, I was supposed to only have four in my house. Yep. Uh, max, and I kind of snuck a few in here and there, and just kind of built my way up. Yeah, I've got some little nanos, like you know, three or smaller. I mean, this is technically one, right? But they're three different tanks plumbed together. So I can, nice. I can, you know, seven same or maybe filter, four. Same system. Yeah, same system. But it takes up my entire living room. So people come in here and do like maintenance in my apartment. They're like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> this wall of tanks and they walk in. So yeah, that's funny. Where do you see yourself in like five years? Like, do you plan to continue doing stuff maybe in the industry or kind of doing your own little thing or? I don't know yet. And that's kind of scary, but I feel like that's what it is being like 22 right now is, uh, you know, I can see myself going and really trying to pursue the academic side of this. And maybe I'll look at doctoral programs. I really, I really like selling coral and growing coral and talking about this stuff. And I've got, you know, the position of reef builders now. And mm -hmm. I, I think it'd be fun if I could make it work financially to just stay in the industry. And I'd probably be happy doing that too. So maybe I'll do something completely unrelated to coral, but I don't think so. I think I'll probably stick around in some capacity for sure. So maybe Absolutely. school, maybe industry, but I think my future is definitely, in, you know, very much intertwined with coral. Awesome. Yeah, very cool. So one thing I was thinking about is we talk about diversity a lot in the reef aquarium, especially around the microbiome discussion. Uh, how do you feel about, there's a lot of different uh, bacteria products out there to put in your aquarium. Uh, some of them don't really say what type of bacteria is in there, and then some of them do. How do you feel about listing those on the bottle? I think if they did it, no one would buy their product. Really? Really? I've, I've tested a lot of these, and like I say, I'm not trying to get a slander charge right here, but uh, yeah, there's not really any anything on the market. There's like one, one company uh, that even has like halophilic or like saltwater bacteria that they offer. Dr. Tim's also does. That's nitrifying strains, right? A little mm -hmm. bit of a different thing we're looking at. So most yeah. of these products are just bacterial strains that have been taken from the human health in industry, like probiotics and just deployed in a similar way. And some can have effects, right? So 
if you've got a bacteria that metabolizes uh, nitrates and you add that to your tank, you'll see a reduction in nitrates. That's like all of the clean products that you typically see. Uh, the question is, will that have like a lasting impact on the microbiome in a good or bad way? I can see both sides of that, that it would not because they don't reproduce in salt water. But also if you've got some beneficial bacteria that eat that same waste product, and then you add in a bunch of these other guys and you just decrease the supply like that, you could maybe shift the microbiome in ways that you did not expect, which could be problematic. So I think, you know, transparency would be a thing, but I don't think any of these companies will ever do it. I think instead, probably what we need to be looking for and pushing for is an investment in infrastructure to develop new and better products mm. that are transparent. And it's here is this coral associated bacteria. It was isolated. It's been screened. It is a symbiont. It is not pathogenic. Here is the role it does. And here is proof that it can live and reproduce in your tank. That's the standard we should be holding these companies to, I think. And it's, these are things that could be done. I mean, yeah. it's things that I've considered and, you know, I, I've not done them because the commercial time and things that would take to scale it up is something I don't have the time for, but any sufficiently large company uh, should be able to do this in a relatively short amount of time. Yeah, for sure. And then instead of just telling us what the product maybe does for our tank, educate it on like what the stuff is and how it's actually doing some of the stuff. I, yeah, I think that'd be very beneficial. So where can people find more about you? You are, uh, you write articles for Reef Builders. I believe you are also doing a live stream every once in a while on Reef Builders. I want to give it all away, but where can people find you out there if they want to learn more about you and learn more from you about some of the stuff we've talked about? Yeah, so Reef Builders is my number one. Uh, number two, Post on Facebook a lot. That's pretty much the only social media I'm active on. So, you know, you can follow me on Facebook and I typically will post when I have a new article out and things like that. I'm going to a lot of the shows. So I have a list of the shows I'm going to. I also, I do consultations. So people, if they want help with their ICP test or aquabiomics test and want my opinions on, you know, kind of making a game plan, then you can message me and I've got uh, ways to set that up. So yeah, Facebook and Reef Builders are the two biggest ways. I've got live streams every Thursday I do with reef builders. And then I have articles about uh, once or twice a week. So that's kind of where I'm at and where I live right now. Very cool. And you, you have a show coming up soon that you're going to be speaking at? Yep. I'll be at Reefstock Denver. So if anyone's attending that, I'll be doing a, a coral disease workshop, teach people how to use microscopes and identify different bacteria. And then I'll also be giving about an hour long talk, kind of uh, breaking down coral diseases from a much more scientific and deeper level. So, you know, a lot of what I've said is just kind of rehashing a multitude of papers I've read, but I'll be diving into the data and showing here's what these studies looked at and here's what this really means for our tanks. Awesome. Another thought just popped into my head about if you're you're teaching us how to identify things under a microscope, having our own like pocket microscope, or maybe we pull out some sand with the dinoflagellates on it, we can kind of look at those and identify what type of dinos we have. Yeah. So dinos are like a big one. That's number one. Uh, number two, if you have a fish that dies, you can always take a uh, gill or skin scrapings and that can be useful sometimes to determine if you've got like a, you know, like you can see your anema under a microscope and things like that. And it's, it's really obvious. So like, you know, scraping scores, like sores on a dead fish, you don't have to wait for aquabiomics that way. That's another one. And then sometimes there's like weird types of algae you'll get, like, like you know, there's chrysophytes and really odd stuff to where it looks like turf algae, it looks like hair algae, but it looks a lot different under a microscope because some of these guys are actually a type of cyanobacteria. And then uh, what I think is something that could be utilized is looking at uh, mucus on coral. So determining hmm. what the typical concentration of guys will kind of look like and then comparing that to a disease state. So kind of my head logic is likely you're going to see a lot more Vibrio excels and things like that. So I'll be kind of walking people through that at Reefstock and showing here's what these cell types will look like. And if you're seeing all those under the microscope, now you know it's a biological issue and it's on the microbiome side of things. So it allows you to do these things on your own with minimal effort uh, compared to having to wait a couple of weeks or a month for aquabiomics. That's really awesome because that gives us a tool that we can use and you're not waiting months or something for the test result to come back. And I know I've, I've done that with dinos to see how to treat it, whether it's like they're the ones in the water column where I need a UV sterilizer or something, or it's just I can treat it a different way. So it is very helpful. Well, thank you so much, Salem, for joining us on the Coral Reef Talk podcast. Thank you for breaking down kind of coral diseases and pathogens 
And it's exciting to learn these things. It's a fascinating world, the microbiome. And I'm sure that uh, we'll have to get together again and talk more a little deeper. But yeah, it was awesome learning from from you. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me on and letting me talk. So it was fun. It was good having you. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. And we will see you next time on the Coral Reef Talk. Thank you.